Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we'll resume in one minute. So could you take your seats, please? Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, can you take your seats, please, and can you conclude your conversations, and we'll get started. Uh, it's now quarter to three. I hope you enjoyed your lunch, and for those of you who attended the session on EU scrutiny, I hope it was, it was a fruitful session for you. The next point on our agenda this afternoon is a discussion on delivering on development which will focus on what the EU needs to do to implement its development policy in the coming years ahead. And for this item, we've assembled a range of speakers, uh, including the respected international philanthropist, Dr. Mo Ibrahim, chairman of the Mo Ibrahim Foundation, MEP, Ms. Michelle Stifler, who's the vice chair of the European Parliament's Development Committee, and Mr. Barry Andrews, of the Goal International Aid Organization. Barry is the chief executive of Goal. We have uh, approximately two hours for this session, and we're going to kick off with a presentation from Dr. Mo Ibrahim. Uh, thank you, Dominic. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Mo Ibrahim, and uh, I. I uh, I founded this foundation. Uh, I'm not sure you are familiar with, so I'm going to take just two minutes to explain uh, what we do. Uh, I am a businessman, and uh, so I'm not a do-gooder. Uh, I introduced mobile phones into South, into Sub-Saharan Africa. We, that was uh, a useful thing to do, and. Uh, when I sold the company in 05, I decided to uh, give the money back to Africa. And uh, I thought long and hard about what is the best way uh, to give back to Africa. And uh, I came to a conclusion uh, that the best way to help really uh, is to look at what, what we need in Africa to end uh, really poverty and uh, to, to change things in Africa. And I came to the conclusion that, that what Africa needs above everything is better governance, good governance. Uh, because there is no need for Africa to be poor. Africa is a huge continent, uh, very rich in resources. And uh, what happened over the 50 uh, years in the past was a succession of uh, misrule, bad governance, and uh, nothing will change. No amount of aid or no amount of uh, whatever will help change things in Africa unless Africa itself change the way it is governing itself and unless uh, African leaders come forward really and do what leaders should do, which is to focus on governance. So what we're doing is that uh, the most important project we do 
uh, is called uh, our index of governance. Uh, we're starting from the point that everybody talk about governance. Uh, it's like everybody is good. You know, it's, it's a nice thing to talk about governance. It's, it's like don't beat up your mother. Nobody disagrees with that. But mother-in-law, okay, both of them. <laughs> and uh, but what what is good governance? Uh, we think it is measurable, and uh, so we measure uh, 88 parameters in every single country in Africa. And uh, this cover all areas from rule of law, safety of people, uh, economic opportunity, management of public finance, jobs, inflation, uh, infrastructure, how much has been built last year, access to water, access to electricity, education, uh, health, uh, with all kind of details underneath that. And uh, gender, we issue measure eight parameters uh, to monitor uh, women's uh, political, economic, uh, uh, and social rights. And we publish that every year. We rank all these elements. Uh, of course, it's a huge publication, about 400 pages. Uh, we have the full cooperation of some 24 organizations around the world. Uh, we have access to all the raw data, uh, and we go and collect what, what is missing. Uh, it's the most comprehensive set of data, uh, 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 really, uh, produced in any continent uh, to describe exactly uh, where every government, where every country is at every year, and what's important, not only where you are, but where you're coming from. Because we have been publishing now for six years, we have data for 10 years, it's important to, to track what's happening in, in all uh, uh, these areas, uh, whether it's human rights, or whether it is, 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 is uh, 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 democracy or, or, or whatever. Uh, so that's something we do. Uh, we also uh, uh, started uh, a prize, a prize for African leaders. Our view here is that if an African leader come to power democratically and then move his country or her country, we have two women presidents now, forward, and we have all the data, uh, and then left the office on time without playing with the Constitution, peacefully and democratically, uh, he will be considered for a prize. We have a prize committee, which I'm not a member of, and uh, we offer $5 million uh, for the president and $200,000 for life. And the objective of that uh, is not, this is not a prize for the bad guys, because the bad guys can make billions of dollars. This is a prize for the wonderful people who come and do the job and then they have nothing to do. Uh, leaders in Europe or United States, after office, they become rich actually, uh, because they join the boards of banks and big companies, etc., and they publish memoirs, and you know they have a good life, and they can continue to do what they like to do. Uh, our good leaders have no place to go. And uh, what we're doing is we're saying, you are really good people, you need to continue to serve. And there is life after office. And uh, so those winners have been engaged in the uh, civil life and probably doing something, uh, some stuff which is not less important than what they were doing uh, when in their office. Uh, we had three winners so far, President Chisano of uh, 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 Mozambique, uh, a man who achieved peace uh, by bringing the, the uh, uh, guerrillas and the opposition, Renamo, uh, into public life, liberalized the economy, and uh, introduced election, and left on time. 
We think that's a wonderful thing uh, to do. Then there is Festas Mukhai from Botswana. Uh, Botswana is the, probably one of the best countries really governed in Africa, if not in the world, actually. A great example. And then there is President Prayas of Cape Verde. Uh, Nelson Mandela received an honorary prize because he doesn't qualify because he left a long time ago. Uh, the idea of this also is not just to bring those people forward, but to offer different role models for our children and our people, and also for you, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it is very depressing for me whenever I go and address a conference uh, in Europe or in the United States, and uh, I ask the audience, how many people know Shisano? Nobody, one or two people. How many people know Bukhai? Nobody. Uh, how many people know Aidi Amin? Everybody raise their hand. How many people know Mobutu? Everybody raise their hand. Mugabe, everybody. And look, this is, is not right. That's not the image of Africa. Because we have heroes, unsung heroes in Africa, people need to know. Uh, then we do our forum every year. We do a number of things, but that's stuff, basic stuff we do. I think that's enough to explain about the foundation. And the issue of aid, and uh, uh, first, I really like to salute the European Union uh, as the largest uh, uh, block which really providing international aid and solidarity. That is a wonderful uh, 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 thing for the Europeans to do. Very much appreciated. Uh, but what aid? In my view, the best aid is the, end, is, the, is the aid which ends the need for aid. That's why aid needs to be smart and to be clever. The objective of aid is to end the need for aid. And let us see where, what kind of intervention can help people stand up on their feet. Developmental aid is very important. And we need really to focus on that area. I'm not minimizing the importance of humanitarian aid. Of course, if somebody, there's a disaster somewhere, uh, people need to help, that's human solidarity. But the objective of the humanitarian aid is uh, different. In Africa, uh, in our agenda, and our discussions around in Africa, there is, we have a very clear issues, very clear agenda. Number one is the regional economic integration of Africa. That's important. That's the number one uh, uh, issue on the African agenda because we need a scale. You gave a wonderful example by forming the European Union. And what we need is to emulate that example. We need to have a freedom of movement of goods people and capital across Africa. Africa need to trade with each other. Inter-African trade at the moment is standing at 11, 12 percent. That's not good enough. Cost of moving goods across Africa is very, it's much cheaper to move goods into Africa from China than moving it across Africa. That's not acceptable. So that is something essential for growth in Africa, the growth of trade and the, the ability to labor to move across the continent, ability of capital to move across the, uh, the, across the continent, that enhance scale. And because frankly, some small African countries can be not viable. Not viable, they are in the middle of nowhere, very small population. Will I go and invest in this country? No. How are you going to get out? How are you going to exit your investment? It's a problem. How can you scale your business is a problem. You cannot move your goods out of that country is a problem. So all, a lot of the projects now, I mean, the African Development Bank, for example, and you need to have a good discussion with those people because you know what's going on in Africa, focusing most of, of projects now into projects which underpin the economic integration of Africa. That is really helped to move the whole continent uh, uh, forward. The second important issue is agriculture. 70% of African people live on land. Agriculture is done by women, not by men. 
major problem with agriculture is lack of investment and lack of funding. Title, title of the land is a big problem. Countries, unfortunately, states are sitting on the titles and they're not giving to the people who are farming. Then you are a woman, you have two acres of land, subsistence farming, you need to $100 or $200 to buy some fertilizer to go to the bank, the bank will not give it to you because you have no title. People are unable to get the best seeds or do uh, much about it. This is an issue need to be addressed and how to support and invest in agriculture. And uh, that is a mainstay really uh, in Africa. Because Africa will not compete with Europe in making aeroplanes or trains, but maybe you can make better potatoes and, and, and tomatoes than you. And uh, that, that, of course, it will help a lot if you uh, stop subsidizing your agriculture, which uh, I don't know why you spend so much money subsidizing your, your agriculture. Uh, then the issue of youth. Young people is a very important issue in Africa. 50% of the African people are below 19 years and a half. 50%. That is a major issue for us in Africa. What those guys gonna do? Where the jobs gonna come from? We really need to think about that. Resources. They, I mean, natural resources, the, the oil and gas, do not generate many jobs. Very little jobs generated from that. Agriculture generates a lot of jobs. So you can see how these two can link together. With youth comes the issue of education. And one interesting statistics in, uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa says that the higher educated you are, the most educated you are, the more educated, the less chance of getting a job. Think about that. What kind of education then are we offering to our young people? Is that the education which the business need, where jobs need? I think not. So we really need to revisit our curriculum. We need business people to be involved with the development of the curriculum because that's important. Uh, Education is something so important, you cannot leave it to some bureaucrats in the Ministry of Education. However, well-meaning, maybe they are divorced really from the life and the business or what's going out there. So we really need uh, to, to, to do something uh, uh, about the issue uh, of, uh, of education. Uh, I'm going to stop from here uh, to, because I'm sure there will be a chance to take some more. Thank you for your uh, patience. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mo. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker today is Mrs. Stifler from the European Parliament. So, uh, by the way, if you want to speak from the podium or from the from the seat, that's either is fine. It would, up to you. Okay. Ça ira très bien, merci. Fine, thank you. Well, good afternoon, everybody. I'm delighted to be with you today at this 49th conference of the European Affairs Committees of the National Parliaments. And I'm grateful to the Irish Presidency of the Council for putting development, this key part of our external action, on the agenda. In September 2000, the UN adopted the Millennium Declaration with specific goals and dates for achieving them by 2015. Significant progress has been made on achieving the MDGs. I want to emphasize this point because often we just tend to focus on the failures. However, two years away from the deadline, a lot remains to be done because everywhere in the world, people are still suffering from poverty, hunger, if not famine and inequality. It's estimated that 1.3 billion people are living in uh, conditions of extreme poverty. The high-level panel studying the situation post-2015 now presented a report, which is the starting point for the UN consultation process, looking at the period after the MDGs.
And it's important to see that this is a framework that goes beyond the old paradigms with the antagonism of public-private or north-south. First of all, the world is less and less dependent on ODA. 85% of financial flows from developed countries to developing countries are from the private sector, and only 15% is official development assistance. And then it's important that partner countries play a more proactive role. They need to adapt the new framework to their national priorities. They have to use their budgets responsibly and create an environment which encourages economic development and private investment. It's also vital for partner countries to have an efficient and fair mechanism for tax collection. The European uh, Commission in their agenda for change uh, on the impact of development policy recommend strengthening precisely this area as a condition for EU budget support. Now, ODA is only one way of supporting development. Uh, you need economic growth accompanied by fair redistribution to ensure an effective and sustainable fight against poverty. Now, the financial resources need to address the challenges facing poor countries are substantial. They go far beyond ODA. And so we need to combine ODA with an economic policy for the medium and long term to create the conditions for private sector development and to integrate developing countries into the global market. And the stakes are very high because uh, at 1,000 billion of investment are expected in developing countries between 2015 and 2030. And the European Union needs to be fully committed with a coordinated position uh, in, in, for September of this year on the MDGs. The Monterey consensus on development financing uh, meant that the EU committed to dedicate 0.7% of gross national income to development aid by 2015. But the economic crisis and budget cuts has triggered a def decrease in ODA flows. So, fellow parliamentarians, it's regrettable that most EU member states are far, in fact, a long way off uh, their commitment of 0.7% of GNI by 2015. I think as parliamentarians, we ought to denounce this failure to meet commitments. It's very important to, not to allow the current crisis in the EU to hold back uh, our progress in this area. We need to build on achievements made so far. Bill Gates recently visited the European Parliament and gave concrete evidence of how the EU has saved lives and improved the lives of the poorest. Let me just give you one example. Malaria. Malaria is a fatal disease, but we can eradicate it today. Progress in this area has been significant thanks to contributions from the EU. If we decreased funding, that would actually cancel out genuine progress. And in the light of the current tough times, it's even more necessary to make sure that aid is spent efficiently with the best possible results. The European Commission's agenda for change follows that approach. To make sure that we're completely efficient, the EU has to speak with one voice and deliver as one to produce the best results. Moving on to the MFF for 2014 to 2020, at the 8th of February Council, member states decided to inflict a 10% cut on the budget originally planned by the European Commission and heading for the EU as a global partner, which includes development aid and humanitarian aid, suffered a, a, a severe 16% cut compared with the Commission's initial proposal. So the amount decreased from 70 billion for that period to 58.7 billion following decisions by the member states. The Council also granted 26.98 billion euros to the 11th European Development Fund. So 26.9 compared to the 30.3 billion suggested by the European Commission. Now it's crucial that the global amounts for the 11th 
EDF and Development Corporation allow the EU to meet its commitment to set aside 0.7% of GDP for development aid by 2015. And the European Parliament, in fact, rejected the agreement on the MFF in its current form. The Parliament, the Irish Presidency, are currently negotiating on this. I can assure you my colleagues from the Development Committee, Mr. Martinez, my colleague, is with us today, in fact, are battling to make sure that the development and humanitarian budgets are really adequate to meet our challenges and commitments. We can't accept further budget cuts. The agenda for change, which I was talking about, introduces the concept of differentiation at the heart of development policy. This principle means that in the future, we'll be targeting development aid to the poorest countries. So we will have a differentiated approach for aid and partnerships to maximize the impact of our aid. But we still have widespread fragmentation and proliferation in aid. A joint program of the EU and member states could help reduce this fragmentation and increase impact and efficiency. This is an essential issue, but it's a sensitive one because member states aren't in favor of this system. They want to retain all the visibility and profile that their aid giving provides. Ladies and gentlemen, the EU is the largest donor of humanitarian aid in the world. It's a moral imperative. It's a fundamental expression of EU solidarity and values. Humanitarian disasters and need constantly increase, mainly due to climate change. And the 2014-2020 MFF is very alarming. And uh, the budget will not meet the needs of the victims of disasters. I'd but I'd like to conclude on a positive note. According to the Eurobarometer in 2012, European citizens still massively back European humanitarian aid in spite of the recession and substantial pressure on public finances. So let me reiterate, it's very important that member states do meet their commitment to put aside 0.7% of their GDP to development aid. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and our next speaker is uh, the Chief Executive of the Goal Organization, Mr. Barry Andrews. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, <coughs> ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to thank you for uh, inviting me for, uh, to participate um, in this afternoon's session. Um, by way of introduction, uh, I used to be a member of the Irish Parliament and indeed uh, a regular attender at COSAC as the Vice Chairman of the European Affairs Committee in the Irish Parliament. So I'm here to reassure all of you that there is indeed life after politics. So don't panic too much. Um, I just want to respond uh, to two points that were made by earlier speakers. Uh, uh, Dr. Ibrahim raised the issue of the coherence of EU policy. In other words, comparing on the one hand the incredibly proactive development and humanitarian assistance program of the European Union, while on the other hand the issue of the protection of agricultural subsidies. Uh, and other me measures that are very difficult to uh, fully explain and reconcile with, the, with. And therefore, it is a very difficult question for European parliamentarians uh, to be able to square that particular circle. And I'm sure there will be further conversation about that today. Also, in the context of the post-2015 agenda, um, the co-chair of the high-level panel on the post-2015 agenda, David Cameron, the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, has referred to what he calls the golden thread, which is those elements that run through all of the breaks on development in, the wor in, in developing countries. And he identified them as governance, the rule of law, and conflict. And where all of these are present, corruption, where there, are, uh, where there is conflict, where there is the absence of the rule of law and protection of property rights, there tends to be a break in development. And as Dr. Ibrahim pointed out, nobody can ever argue that Africa isn't rich in resources, um, but what it lacks is those elements that uh, Prime Minister Cameron has identified. So a person like myself working for the NGO sector 
We're very anxious to see that those issues would be tackled in the post-2015 context. Uh, Goal is one of Ireland's leading NGOs. The other ones you'll be familiar with perhaps are Concern and Trocra, uh, which have earned for themselves and for Ireland a very strong reputation in the context of the NGO sector. But Ireland has been at the forefront of the development debate for many, many years. Going back to our religious missions uh, in the 1960s and before that, innovative uh, ideas in development and health and education were brought to Sub-Saharan Africa and other places by Irish missionaries. More latterly, the NGO sector, through the organizations I've mentioned, Concern, Trocra and Goal, have had a huge impact. In recent times, the Irish government, uh, through Irish Aid, has been one of the most impactful um, government-represented development agencies and it has been part, I think, of ensuring that Ireland remains uh, punching well above its weight in terms of the development agenda. We have also been proud to have individuals like Mary Robinson through the Mary Robinson Climate Justice Foundation through, and Bono and Bob Geldof through the Live Aid process who are individual advocates that have come from this Ireland and, island and truly represent, I think, not just their own passions but the interests of the Irish people and their passion for the development agenda. Last April, as an example of perhaps that passion, uh, Irish Aid, uh, the Irish Presidency and the Mary Robinson Climate Justice Foundation hosted a conference here in Dublin Castle on the question of hunger, nutrition and climate justice. And it had a very strong southern focus and there was an absolute insistence that there would be women farmers, that there would be uh, people from the, uh, from the beneficiaries, we will say, of some of the NGO sectors there to discuss shoulder to shoulder with the policy makers and an insistence that they would shape the post-2015 agenda. And it was only through plugging into that expertise and experience that the quality of the decision making could be improved. And that was an innovation in terms of a conference on those issues that had not been the norm but it is a commitment of the European Union, of the Irish Presidency of the European Union to ensure that that will become the norm and I very much welcome uh, that initiative. There was also an emphasis not just on grassroots but also on the involvement of the private sector and that allows me to pick up on a further point that Dr. Ibrahim made. The private sector is of course going to be the real lever of change in developing countries in the years to come. And it's not just because Europe has, is not as fertile a ground for investment as it used to be, but it is also because of the natural wealth and resources and people that Africa enjoys. It's impossible to talk about Africa in a general way, given a billion people live there, a thousand languages are used there, that all of Europe and America could be fit into there. But if I will be allowed the one generality to say that the private sector is making a huge difference there and aid is being displaced accordingly. But what, how the two synergize is that the mandate of the private sector community is to turn profit. The mandate of the NGO sector is to ensure that that wave of investment raises all boats and that is where that synergy can really work together. And those two with their separate outlooks can be mutually reinforcing in being, ag being an agent for change in the future. The European Union has been very supportive of Goal and other agencies. At the moment, I want to mention just one single intervention that the European Union helps Goal with and funds Goal for, and that's in Sierra Leone, where we have a, uh, a child space project that is dedicated to the principle of child protection. Now, even in developed European countries, child protection is an incredibly complex, difficult and sensitive issue but in the context of a developing country even more so. And it is for this reason that very few NGOs uh, wish to engage in this, in, in, in this work. Uh, but Goal does this in Sierra Leone and the Europe, European Union, to its great credit, is one of the funders that is most inclined to support this kind of work in the future. So my plea to parliamentarians is to remember child protection. It is one of the more difficult, more complex and more sensitive interventions, uh, but it no less requires the attention of parliamentarians uh, throughout Europe. It would be remiss of me today at uh, this opportunity not to mention the worst humanitarian catastrophe since the Cold War which is ongoing today which is in Syria. 
and Goal is very active in Syria. We have a, a very large intervention there, and I was in Syria just six weeks ago where I saw for myself uh, the very great humanitarian need that has developed there. The total failure of the international system to find its voice in any coherent way with regard to Syria really does underline the urgency of what is requ required. Everybody post Rwanda talked about never again, and the UN, to its great credit, set itself the task in delivering in that promise. Yet today the UN still refuses to do any cross-border work from places like Turkey into Syria in order to respect the sovereignty of its own member state, Syria. A huge effort is being made to meet the genuine need on the government side, but in those areas that are not held by the government, there is a developing and much greater humanitarian need today that is not being reached by the European community or by uh, the United Nations. The UN over the last 20 years has grappled with this issue and has tried to reconcile on the one hand the sovereignty of member states and on the other hand the protection of populations from atrocities inflicted or permitted by those member states. To this end, the responsibility to protect uh, principles emerged in the year 2000. In a nutshell, what it means is that sovereignty isn't a right but a duty and a failure to discharge this duty would engage certain responsibilities and consequences. Also under the Geneva Conventions, under Protocol 2, and in customary international law, there is protection for humanitarian assistance. And I would like you European parliamentarians to remember this when these issues come up as to the legality or otherwise of any intervention across border into rebel-held areas. Protocol 2 states, and I quote, if the civilian population is suffering undue hardship owing to a lack of supplies essential for its survival, release, relief actions for the civilian population, which are of an exclusively humanitarian and impartial nature, and which are conducted without any adverse distinction, shall be undertaken subject to the consent of the host state. Now, naturally, that host state is not willing to consent to that. But in its commentary on Protocol 2, the International Committee of the Red Cross said the following. The fact that consent is required does not mean that the decision is left to the discretion of the parties, and that if the survival of the population is threatened and a humanitarian organization fulfilling the required conditions of impartiality and non-discrimination is able to remedy this situation, relief actions must take place. And that is the legal reality, that is a, an interpretation of the legal reality of customary humanitarian law, and I would ask European parliamentarians to remember that when those issues are being discussed in your own host parliaments in the coming weeks and months. If I could finish, uh, Chairman, on the question of the role of NGOs. And last week I had the honour of introducing the Nigerian human rights lawyer, uh, Hawa Ibrahim, who was uh, hosted by the EU representation here in Ireland. And she has defended uh, people being, persecuted, uh, being prosecuted sorry, under Sharia law, including Amina Lawal. Uh, How won the Sakharov Prize in 2005 for her work defending clients charged with offences under Sharia law. And she didn't hold back in her criticism of NGOs and made comments about SUVs, about high overheads, and the cultural insensitivity of language used by NGOs and an almost complete lack of transferability of European or, for that matter, Chinese or American standards to many settings in Africa. And she was heavily critical of the vanity and self-serving nature of NGOs who are more concerned with their televisual image than the quality of the work that they do. And in my conversations with other NGOs over the last six months, it's clear that this message has begun to be considered. Coupled with financial pressures, talk about sorry, rationalization is much more prevalent than has been the case. And recently, much, many countries have moved from being lower-income countries to middle-income countries. The UK has announced that it will cease funding the Indian government after 2015. With a smaller GP in nominal terms than the UK, India still holds almost three times as much foreign exchange reserves as the UK. So it's not surprising that it would end at this time. But Goal is in the process of trying to reconfigure its intervention in India for the long term and to reconcile those issues. In conclusion, Chairman, um, the post-2015 agenda must be shaped through dialogue with those most affected by nutrition, by hunger, by climate change. If that dialogue isn't present, it will obviously impair the quality of the policies that emerge from that 
uh, from that process. But Goal wishes to thank the EU for its ongoing funding and support and very innovative inter interventions in the developing world. Thank you, Chairman. I'm going to open the floor now for our comments and interventions from colleagues. Uh, I'm going to take uh, questions in bunches of five. And at this stage, uh, I'm going to allow up to three minutes per person. I may have to reduce that as the debate goes on, but we have just over a, an hour of a debate. So the first contributor is Mr. Demetrius Salouris from Cyprus. Thank you very much. I will be very brief. Uh, I will stick to the one minute limit. Having listened to Mr. Ibrahim, I believe that uh, I could only ask for one thing. Could he tell us 